thanks for, for joining us today. Um, before introducing Andre, I wanted to just take a, a moment and introduce myself. My name is Chris, and in addition to being an Airstream owner myself, I get the privilege to work with Airstream's brand ambassadors, helping to share their stories of adventure, curiosity, and exploration in their Airstream. And we created this program to help connect owners with others who are curious and want to know more about what Airstreaming is all about. And it reminds me of when I was on my journey uh, to be part of the Airstream community a few years ago, I found it really helpful to connect with those who are already using an Airstream, learning about where they go, what it's like to tow. And so this is our first edition of Ask an Airstreamer. Today we'll have an hour together. Andrea will share with us how she uses her Airstream base camp, where she goes, how she camps, and more. Along the way, we'll stop for some questions, but we also have a dedicated Q&A session at the end. To submit your questions at any point today, there's a Q&A button at the bottom of this screen. Uh, we'll do our best to answer all the questions as we go through today, but if we run out of time, we'll share an email address at the end to submit your questions so we can make sure that we get uh, everyone's questions answered. So before I turn it over to Andrea, just two quick things. There are, are countless ways to use an Airstream Basecamp. Andrea is going to share the way that she uses her Basecamp, but keep in mind that the options are really limitless. And secondly, there's a two question survey that will pop up after we wrap up today. We would really love your feedback to learn about what you liked and things that we could do better in the future. So that's it from me. I'll turn it over to Andrea, Airstream ambassador and Basecamp owner. Andrea, thanks for sharing part of your Saturday with us today. Sure. Thanks, Chris, for introducing me, and welcome to all of you who, who are curious about the Airstream Basecamp. I'm a Basecamp owner based in Seattle, Washington, and in this presentation, I will talk some about why I bought the Basecamp, how I've used it, some lessons learned I have had, and then answer some of your questions. When asked to make this presentation, what immediately came to mind was the question that I got when I first bought the trailer, which is, you did what? Why? The what was easy. I bought a very cool trailer. The why was more of a story. I grew up in wilderness in Idaho, and throughout my life, going back to the wilderness has been ever present. I find myself going back to it for solace, for joy, for feeling connected to people. And as I've gotten older, my work is intense. I run my own business. I have kids with whom I want to spend time. And I live in a big city, Seattle. So the why is all about going back to the wilderness in a different way. I wanted to do it more comfortably and with less complication. All this started with my parents who were incredible outdoorsmen and loved the wilderness. My parents were outfitters for the United States Geological Survey and the United States Forest Service. We had a ranch with over 85 llamas and used them as work animals for that purpose. We also enjoyed them as a family a lot to get deep into the remote areas of Idaho on long extended trips. My parents taught me how to be a llama wrangler and an outdoorsman, and I taught my kids in the Idaho backcountry. My parents were also incredible sailors. They taught me that too, and then I taught my kids in the same way. So when it comes to the base camp, the why is really all about just getting out there in a different way connecting with my people, exploring remote areas, and keeping up with modern work life. In the end, it's all about getting out there. I bought a 2017 base camp. I was an early adopter. I acquired it with the intent to explore the West more and keep up my client contact work remotely. I usually take two big trips per year, you know, per year plus or minus 14 days, and then numerous shorter trips. I use it all four seasons but fewer trips in the winter. I tow it with a crossover SUV, not a big truck. I use my daily driver, the car I already had. And what I love about the base camp is that it's tiny and shiny, it's easy to tow, it's simple to use, and it's very versatile. I'm gonna to talk to you more about all of those aspects in this presentation. I call my base camp my yurt on wheels. I rarely plug it in. I do plug it in in the winter, but I bought more advanced batteries, and of course I have the solar panels, which allow me to go for extended time. And I keep the backpacking and outfitting mentality that I grew up with to keep it light and minimize the weight and waste, with a few exceptions for luxury here and there, 
And I carry a collapsible bike so that I can explore more not using my car. There's a question about um, towing base camp, the, towing the base camp, it looks like, and is that challenging? I actually find it quite easy to tow the base camp. It's very light. It does have trailer brakes, and I added a brake controller to my SUV, and you need that to utilize the trailer brakes. That increases, increases the safety quite a bit. But in general, the trailer is quite easy to pull. There's a question too about um, how you store a trailer. This is a video loop um, showing you how I actually uh, store and uh, get my trailer out. This is a question I get a lot is where the heck do you store it? Uh, when I bought the base camp, I realized that I wanted to have the base camp close to me and I have an unusual coincidence. I live in a, in a historical neighborhood in Seattle that were controlled by the Landmarks Preservation Board and people use the carriage houses here as garages. I asked my neighbor if I could rent. He said yes, um, but it appeared that in order to get my base camp in, I would need to get it in bow first. So I bought a $500 trailer valet um, and an electric drill, which is what they advise you to use it. And I used that to crank the trailer into the garage and crank it out. Um, it works surprisingly well. It looks like another question is about um, strength and mobility with uh, the base camp and hitching and unhitching. I will tell you, I'm kind of a small person. I don't have any problem with strength and mobility when it comes to hitching and unhitching the trailer. What's more important is going through the precise steps and making sure that you're going through your checklist each step of the way in hitching and unhitching the trailer. How do I live in it? I do work remotely in it uh, more, and I'll talk more about connectivity later in the presentation. So I do work in it. I carry my gear in it, my bike, my surfboard, sometimes my water ski, by using the four D rings. And I um, use it to relax. Um, this is the bench bed area of the base camp that you're seeing here in the three different modes that I use it. That back doorway is essential for bringing in all that human powered equipment that you're gonna use and for creating light. It looks like there's a question now about how you maximize storage and, and what do you use? Um, and if the, you could use Velcro to store things. I don't think Velcro would work very well. The few places I have used Velcro, it's, it's not stuck. What I do is I hang canvas bags with hooks um, from the racks, but I also use the storage capacity well um, with uh, different types of compression, compression sacks for my comforter and pillow and foam topper, and I use collapsible pots and pans. Looks like there's also a question about the tables, if the tables seem tricky. You bet, those tables are tricky, and I was really, really perplexed, but I figured it out. Um, the tables are also really integral to the experience, so it's good to know how to do this. What you do is you turn the table upside down with the pole sticking up, and you stand on the table it itself, and you whack the pole side to side and pull it out. So it's all about doing the whack method and not twisting. Hey, Andrea, quick quick question here too that came in. Um, really around if the bed is set up, where do you eat in that situation? Do you convert the bed back to the eating area or do you eat outside? What, tell us a bit about that. Yeah. So the trailer is, is designed to be in one mode at a time. At a time. So if you set up the bed, if you're and if you want to eat, you don't have the tables available to you at all. Um, and uh, if you want to be eating as a group or working, you need to take your bed down and use the tables for eating or working. So it's really one mode or the other. Okay, great, thanks. In the, in the winter, I will say I use a different pattern. Um, in the winter, of course, you need to be plugged in at all time, times or use a generator. I plug in. But in the winter, you really live with your equipment. So it quickly becomes a one to two person trip rather than a multi-person trip. Um, and it takes about 10 to 15 minutes to warm up. It looks like that's one of the questions. It takes about 10 to 15 minutes to warm up. Um, and it's very important in the winter that you use your tank heaters, the tank heater buttons to keep the lines from freezing. And in the winter, you have more, you have more clothes, you have more equipment. And your tow vehicle really ends up being where you do spillover storage. That's true for me pretty much on every single trip that my tow vehicle is my spillover storage space. Hey, Andrea, another follow-up on the winter camping piece. Mm -hmm. do, you, 
uh, if you're leaving Seattle, if it's you know, below freezing and then going to go ski for the weekend, are you winterizing? Do you winterizing or are you just using the heating system before you go to keep everything warm? Um, I, that's actually a really good question. I learned that you, it's a good idea to keep things warm before you go on your trip. You don't want to run those tank heaters when you're driving because they run off the battery. So you want to wait till you get to your place and, and plug in and then, um, then plug in or then turn on the tank heaters. I, because I do use it in the winter and I store it inside, I actually don't winterize it um, because I know that it's warm in my garage. And I know that once I get there to the ski resort that I'm going to be able to um, plug in and heat and heat the trailer up and turn the tank heaters on. Cool. So, yeah. So you know, one of the things I really like about the base camp is that it's really versatile. I can go solo. Um, I can go on a trip with five or six people. There's a picture there uh, with uh, my sons. And um, you can also cram it with a lot of people. And I've gone from one to five to 11. Um, when you go up to 11, it's quite a squeeze, but we really do have a good time when we have lots of people in, uh, in the trailer like that. It's surprising how many how comfortable it is for one, also how comfortable it is for five or six. When you're um, as a group. Quick, quick question uh, with the, the sleeping in that situation. So if you have six people in yeah. there, you're, you're sleeping in there with maybe one other person and then people are setting up tents and everything around that and you're using the base camp as a sleeping area, but also a, a base camp too for the larger group. Yeah, exactly. And that's what I was about to get to, which is, you know, some people, um, when you when you travel, they want their own space. So when I travel with more people, generally the people I'm traveling with have their own tents um, and they have their tents around uh, the base camp or actually in a different campsite altogether. Um, and traveling as a group means that you spend a lot of time around the fire and that the base camp becomes the base camp. But when it comes to sleeping with a group of people, it's generally just me and a friend. Um, in the trailer itself and the base camp becomes a, a base camp when there are a lot of people like that when there's five or six people I do a couple of things I use a pro a portable propane fire pit to be like the center for all of us um, And it's connected to the trailers propane tanks um, And I also use a rug to prevent this the endless pine needle and mud and sand caravan that comes in and out of the trailer and when you cook for a crowd, the base camp is amazing because it's pretty easy to cook for a crowd um, and then bring the food outside and have people eat outside or you know, eat inside. But it is important to have the tables available for um, where, when you do sort of group cooking or to have the tables available for eating outside. This is a six person bike trip that I'll talk to you about um, in a bit. People ask me, where do you go? <laughs> where have you been? I've been to lots of places. It's hard to track them all. I love exploring the national parks, but of course I love exploring Idaho and Washington, uh, my home states, uh, and I spent a lot of time there. Uh, primarily I've been in the Western United States and British Columbia. I did find an interesting way to document some of my trips uh, with an app called Relive. Um, this uh, app allows you to um, set your phone to follow you, and then as you go on your trip, it takes the pictures that you've taken along the way and inserts those pictures um, with your um, with your uh, map along the way. This is a bike tri trip where I supported um, my son and his bike partner, um, who were biking from the most northern point of Washington State to the most southern point of Baja, Mexico, 2,500 miles. A group of four of us joined him and his riding partner for the Washington State portion as a support vehicle for eight days. So we started at Cape Flattery on an Indian reservation surf campground the first night and launched them um, and then left them at Cape Disappointment where uh, Lewis and Clark first saw the Pacific Ocean, an important place of history for Washington State. Um, the routine we had that I developed um, on a previous trip where I was a support vehicle is, is the bikers would leave in the morning. We will identify a campsite 80 to 90 miles uh, forward. I would drive to that campsite 80 to 90 miles forward, drop the trailer, get on my bike and ride back to meet the group of bikers and then twirl around and ride into the camp with them. Um, this uh, worked really well and it, it, it worked for a previous support trip that I did. It was using the base camp like, um, like a camp for all of us. Uh, we had two to three tents. 
um, we had food management issues because there were lots of us. So we had to have extra coolers and lots of tubs. We used the outfitting system for the food management. Um, and we really had to think about um, safety for the bikers. Uh, we had to be focused on calorie count and um, hydration, and of course, keeping them healthy for the remainder of their 2,000 miles that they were going to be going. It's a great example of wet weather, unusual campgrounds, Indian camps, surfer camps, motorcycle camps, RV camps. There was a huge variety on this trip. This next trip um, was a trip exploring Vancouver Island and the British Columbia Sunshine Coast somewhat of an ironic name because uh, it's not usually sunny there, but it was mostly sunny for us. This was a trip where I had several destinations in mind, more surfing at Tofino on the west coast of the island, and also a place called Princess Louise's Inlet, which is on the west coast of, the British, of, the, of British Columbia's mainland, quite far north. It's an example of windy mountain roads and how easy it is to pull that trailer. Very, very windy mountain roads. The ease of driving that trailer on to ferries. This trip involved seven ferries and it was easy to use in that context and it didn't cost us as much because it's a small trailer. It was pretty easy to, um, to pull onto the ferry, but also it cost us less because it was small. I was able to take um, a boat up the inside passage of Princess Louise's Inlet and hike the trails. Uh, and hike um, to the falls, and then also go to a place called Skookumchuk Narrows, which is a famous spot for surfers and kayakers um, in the Northwest, where it has huge standing waves to play on. Um, and then finally, uh, a last trip, I won't go through this very much. This was a solo trip to explore more biking and hiking in the soft use, where I've spent a lot of time llama trekking and I wanted to explore more solo. Yeah, Andrea, a uh, quick question here. Um, is Basecamp good for beginners or is there a different model that's you know, better for someone who's never RV'd before? So I know that you have the Basecamp. We've actually gone on some trips together in my international. Yeah. So I think there's a good, good comparison. What do, you, uh, what do you say to that? You know, one of the things I like about the Basecamp is it's, it's pretty simple. It's not as complicated as um, some other trailers that you see. Um, for a beginner, one of the things that I think is great is that the Airstream dealership goes through with you how to use the trailer uh, and um, the safety measures in the trailer, the meters, the, the way in which you hook up. What I did was um, I actually videotaped that whole session with the dealership and they did a great job of showing me how to do that. Um, it, your first couple trips are going to be learning trips and you've got to embrace the skid as we say you know just go with the flow the fact that the learning comes from experience too uh, and i will tell you i still learn when i take that trailer out it was like oh that's right i've got to do it this way so it is it is challenging but with the guidance of the dealerships with um, some guidance of others who are campers and also um, reading and creating checklists it really is doable the base camp in particular is pretty simple, um, and I appreciate that about, about that trailer. People ask me, you know, what's your favorite trip? And my favorite trip, hands down, was the first long extended trip. And to your point, that's where I learned a lot about the trailer, which is why I love that trip. But it also gave me a chance to be with a loved one. Um, my son decided to ride his bike home from college when he was 20 years old. Uh, from Saratoga, Saratoga Springs, New York, to my door in Seattle. It was on his bicycle 3,800 miles, completely solo and unsupported. I asked to meet him for part of it in the beautiful state of Montana. Uh, so I met him in Chester, Montana, and we traveled for 18 days together, uh, ending in Republic, Washington, with a five-day stopover in Glacier National Park where we were backpacking and hiking. I could overwhelm you with pictures. I'm not going to do that. Um, but what I will show you is uh, the first day, this was the first day I met him. He had already done 2,000 miles, completely solo and unsupported. No one was so happy to see a home cooked meal and a comfy bed. Our routine was very similar to what I mentioned to you earlier, where he would leave in the morning as a biker. I would uh, pack up the trailer and go to the identified campsite 80 to 90 miles forward. 
uh, drop the trailer, get my bike out of the trailer and bike back to him and pull a Yui and pull and do the rest of the mileage with him. He would get his 80 to 90 miles in and I would get generally 40 to 50 miles. Exhaustion and exposure was a big deal for him every day. And the support for that 18 days was really helpful to him. On his, this is what he looked like on the last day um, after our 600 miles together, well fed, well rested and ready to go the remainder of the trip. That trip was important to me because I learned so much and I wanted to share some of those lessons learned with you. And also in doing so, answers to a lot of the questions that have come in. So I'll go through um, some of my lessons learned and, and answer your questions along the way here. Um, what I feel is most important about base camp trips is having a purpose. Be a support wagon, a hike you wanna go on, a group of people you wanna be with, a work project where you want isolation, uh, a destination that's important to you or your family. I think having a purpose is really important to base camp trips. I get a lot of questions about gear. I use the awning a lot. Um, it, it creates a, a sunbreak and it also allows you to hang, hang things from the awning like wet towels or such. Um, I really believe in going light. I have collapsible bowls and collapsible pans, collapsible colander, collapsible uh, teapot, collapsible buckets. Uh, everything so that it compresses and can and can be stored easily. I use lightweight chairs and outdoor tables, the kind that backpackers use. I think it's important to not spend a lot of money on it. There's lots of secondhand stores that carry this kind of stuff, as well as secondhand um, outdoor stores that backpackers use. Like I mentioned before, I carry a propane fire pit. There's a lot of fire bans in Western states um, and having a propane fire allows you to still have, a, have that glow in the evening. Um, but also, um, I really don't think carrying firewood and a fire pan around is, is really worth it, especially when you need to be using your tow vehicle for other storage. Um, and of course, having a toolkit, assemble the tools that are relevant to your base camp and to your vehicle. And st I store mine in a Carhartt um, fabric toolkit roll and it's handy for me to grab but it has exactly the tools that I need for my vehicle and for my base camp. When it comes to storing, um, like I said, I hang stuff, uh, but watch out for the watermelon juicer. Uh, at one trip, I stored a watermelon in one of the canvas bags that it was hanging from the rack and we went on a very windy, uh, bumpy road and it basically acted as a pulverizer. It pulverized the watermelon and then the canvas bag acted as a sieve and all the watermelon juice got all over the, the trailer. So watch out for the watermelon juicer if you hang food. Um, I use compression sacks for the, my comforters, my pillows, sleeping bags, the memory foam topper, and I store all of that in the starboard bench. Um, and there's actually even more room in there for other things. I use additional coolers for drinks and frozen items for future days. Um, and I use plastic tubs for food storage. I use the outfitting method where I make bags for each day, mark the bags as to what day it is, put it in the tubs and mark the tubs as to which day that food is being used for. So on an 18 day trip, you can imagine that's kind of important. Another thing about gear is you need to be thinking about critters and mice. Um, the 2 a.m. mice chasing is not fun. Believe me, I've been there, done that. Uh, so I do store food that mice would be interested in in tubs. And also keep in mind bears. A bear lock cooler is required in most national parks. Um, so I use a bear lock cooler and of course I put food in my tow vehicle if I need. Here's some examples of like going light and some luxury versus luxuries for my family. Guitars are a luxury. Uh, it's not light, but we usually have one regular guitar and a travel guitar. A little luxury for me is a small cooler. Um, you can see that small Yeti in the upper left-hand picture um, that I use for when we go have cocktails at a viewpoint or when I'm going on a lunch hike. I like to have a small little cooler. That's a little bit of a luxury. This is also a picture of a mistake that I made, which is I, the first time I took my bike, I strapped it down with bungee cords on the D-rings. You don't wanna use bungee cords because they have give. When I opened up the door, the gear was all over the place, including my water ski going upright. So um, you need to use those rubberized wire gear ties um, because they have no give and that holds your gear in. 
Uh, really, what's great about the base camp, my yurt on wheels, is that it enables me to go to beautiful remote places, but you really got to be thinking about scouting the road to your campsite first. And um, before you drive into it, go take a look at the road that accesses the campsite and go take a look at that campsite before you get into a situation that you can't back out. Um, also, what I like to do, if there, there's a day hike along the way and I'm pulling my trailer, what I like to do is put the trailer in a safe place um, at the side of the road and then drive the tow vehicle up to the trailhead if it's a windy dirt road and then come back down and pick up the trailer and then go. No reason to take your trailer on a, on a dirt road up to a trailhead. When it comes to conservation, when you're going for a long extended period of time, that looks like we've got some questions about this. How long can you go for? Especially remote areas, I, I believe I can go for about five days, but you really have to be thinking about a couple of things. Um, you have to keep an eye out on your meters. You do, I always look at my freshwater tank and my uh, combined black gray water tank, the, the meter on that before I do dishes or before I take a shower um, so that I learn my usage patterns. What's great about having people travel with you is that they always want to help with the dishes, but they tend to use their method they, they use at home and you've really got to coach them on using the camping method in washing dishes. You want to use your black gray water tank on long, um, you know, for that five day, five day extent before you get pumped out. You really want to be using your black gray tank more for the black, less for the gray. So I take showers outside on trips like that and I use the pass through of uh, in the in the bathroom, that's a fantastic feature that Airstream has in there, so that you can you can conserve the gray water that's going into um, your black gray tank. Taking showers outside makes a huge difference. Andrea, a couple of questions coming in too. Um, first one is around towing and driving. Do you notice in terms of fuel efficiency what's what's the difference that you get in the your tow uh, when you tow? Yeah, that's a really good question. Um, it, you know, it's very, my, my fuel efficiency is a little bit less than normal um, with the um, pulling the base camp, except of course, when you're going over passes and there's high elevation, I'm burning more gas at high elevation. And of course the, the um, incline, I'm burning much more gas. I was actually surprised that my, my fuel consumption didn't go up a huge amount. The trailer is only 2,500 pounds. And then of course, if you add all of your gear, you're in nearing like 3,000 pounds. So it's it's really not as heavy as a lot of the other trailers. It's pretty light, so fuel consumption is pretty good. And then how about a couple others here? Um, and you and I have talked about this separately, but when you look at base camp versus maybe a Bambi or a Caravel, what were yeah. some of the things that drew you to base camp? Yeah, um, so what definitely drove me there was I wanted to be in the wilderness more. And so I wanted a, a trailer that was lighter easier to pull. The base camp is 2,500, the Bambi's 900 pounds later, and the, the caravan's even heavier. So weight was an issue. Also for me was the ease of use and the, and, uh, the yurt feel to it. I wanted something that was more outdoorsy and more like a yurt and really simple and small. Um, the Bambi, uh, you know, has its advantages as does the caravan. I love, uh, or as, you know, do the other, um, Airstream trailers, but I really wanted the wilderness aspect, the simplicity, and a lower weight. I think a comparison that you use when, when we often go together is yours is the yurt on wheels and mine is the, the condo or the apartment on wheels, right? Yours is the beautiful New York apartment on wheels and mine, <laughs> the, and mine is the, the yurt on wheels. All right, one, one more here before you uh, yeah. go on. Um, this is around trip planning. Yeah. So, how much detail or flexibility do you have? Are you planning basically every moment of the trip or do you basically set a foundation and then play by ear? Um, I, I set a foundation and then play it by ear. I actually have a whole slide set on that about what the resources that I use to plan trips. I think it's a really good idea to plan your route and to identify campsites that you want to be using that fit your need. But of course it's important to be, to be somewhat flexible and say, you know what, I wanna stay an extra day here or extra two days here. On that British Columbia trip, actually, we left one day early because, like we said, you know what? We saw Princess Louise's Inlet today, and we saw Skookum Check yesterday, and we're done. Let's go home. So I think flexibility is really, really possible with it. But I'll talk more about that planning in a few slides for sure. Okay, cool. 
So um, I get a lot of questions about safety because I'm a, a woman in a trailer alone in remote areas, and I think it's a really important thing to be conscious of. When I go to a solo, I um, set up as if there's two people, two chairs, and um, multiple sets of shoes. In fact, I carry a pair of men's shoes with me in the base camp um, so that I uh, can put those out and people see that. I always unhitch the car and get it in a ready to exit position and keep the key handy. That's also important if you need to hit the panic button and get attention. Um, I always try to have the base camp door, and this picture shows this, the base camp door facing my camp. That can be tricky to pull off, uh, and, but uh, you want to be able to keep an eye out on the door as to who goes in or what goes in, including critters. Um, and I think it's important, and almost all our stream leaders talk about this, which is you want a magnetic hide a key or a lock box. Um, there's always that 30 seconds of panic when your travel companion has realized that they've locked the, the key in the trailer and that they've done the unthinkable uh, and you get a little bit of, uh, of joy and laughing at, with them about it because then you pull out your hide key and say no problem, but that's important. Um, and then I also think hitch locks are a, a source of peace of mind. Also important to keep a first aid kit, a good first aid kit, handy, not buried, but easy to grab and always tell your companions about where it is. Um, and then I really believe in keeping the trailer clean and the food cold. You may need to be buying ice to fill those coolers that you are carrying in addition, especially on long trips. Getting sick on the base camp is not fun, and especially when you're supporting other people who are doing physical activity. Um, so connectivity is something that I definitely learned a lot about. Um, this is a picture at a very wet day at a ski resort. Uh, it rained all day and I worked all day um, from the trailer. Uh, it quickly went from 35 degrees and raining to 22 degrees overnight. And interestingly enough, all of our tires froze into the parking lot that night. Um, but Air I use something called Airstream Connected. It's Airstream's rooftop antenna. It works really well for me. It's AT&T service plan. Um, it's faster than my phone, uh, and so I can stream and I can do video calls. And I can also get access to it when I'm driving. So my phone can be accessing um, that system and I use less cell service. I also have a backup in case I can't get AT&T service with a different provider. Um, but you need to plan for connectivity. National parks, you know, if there's no connectivity, you have to be outside the national park to get that. Um, and some remote areas, you don't have any connectivity. So if you're taking a trip and you really are relying on connectivity, you've got to be planning for it. It looks like there's a question about computer hardware and what I use. I use, pretty, I use a Microsoft Surface Pro laptop um, and that has a camera in it. That's all, that's all I use. Um, there's a question about ch um, charging, and I'll talk about that in a second in the next few slides. Actually, this next slide, um, about adaptations. Adaptations are all about how you plan to use the trailer. My adaptations are based on how I plan to use the trailer. Um, I have solar panels and I bought stronger batteries, but whenever you have solar panels, you really need to be conscious of the tree canopy at your campsite, because if you spend more than one or two days with a really dense tree canopy, you're not getting the charge that you need from your solar panels. Generally, when you're driving, you're, you're cranking up on the solar and it works just fine, but if you're in one place for a while, sometimes you don't get that charge. There it looks like there's a question about charging your phone or charging your computer. You can charge your phone with the USB connectors in the trailer off the battery, but if you wanna be charging your computer or other battery packs, I added an inverter um, and I installed it right above the batteries underneath the sink and it's connected to the power tower that's right next to the sink. And so I can charge my computer uh, and other battery packs there. Another adaptation I did was um, I added a teak floor to the bathroom. Uh, so there've been some questions about how wet does the bathroom stay and how easy um, is, it, it is, how easy is it to clean? Super easy to clean. But what I find is that I don't like the grit that builds up on the bottom of the floor. So I had a teak floor made. Um, there's a company called teak, for, teak Works for you that makes Airstream teak floors. Um, and also that shows you the pass through for the shower in that picture. Another adaptation I did was I took the screen uh, and used it as a template 
to build a boat vinyl window for the back uh, door of the trailer uh, because uh, it's quite chilly in the Northwest and that allowed me to um, be warmer. It, it really, your adaptations are all about what, how you use the trailer and, and your needs. These are the adaptations that I did for my specific needs. When it comes to cooking, uh, my rule of thumb is boil, barbecue, or saute. Uh, it, it, that's the menu you need to plan. Um, in this picture, you can also see um, a collapsible stew pot that I use frequently that backpackers use. But really, your, your approach needs to be um, pretty simple. Uh, and barbecuing outside makes a really big difference. When it comes to planning, um, really, I believe in planning the route, identifying and reserving your campsites in advance. I like to print out day one, day two, day three, day four in terms of the campsites, put it in a folder, and, and that allows me to flip through that really easily. Not all campgrounds are good for more outdoorsy camping, so you've really got to be looking for the type of campground that you want on your trip. Um, and it's important to do check-ins with your people. Uh, if you have connectivity, definitely call in to your people at home and say, hey, I'm, I'm safe, or you plan on your route uh, moments where you will connect with other people. I, I always provide a flight plan. The visual helps me too. I love paper maps and I love having those with me. So um, the resources that I use above and beyond those maps are uh, Campendium. Um, Campendium and Airstream partner together to develop these, uh, develop a camping uh, site guide on the highest rated sites that Airstreamers have used. Um, it also gives you connectivity information, which is really critical. So Campendium is like my number one place that I go, and the fact that they partner with Airstream works really well for me. Um, I also use um, the best Airstream camping guide for ideas. Uh, the images and some of the ideas that other Airstreamers have provided have been helpful to me. And I also use um, the guide Exploring Public Lands, that's on airstream.com. Of course, I'm also using national parks and national forests and other sources of information like the REI stations are really helpful as well. Um, but don't forget that there's alternative campgrounds. There's the Conservation Corps, um, Army Corps of Engineers. There's wineries and farms and breweries that are part of Harvest Hosts. I use them. There's also music festivals where you can camp. Harvest hosts I usually use on my way to other distant locations and you can try camp for one night at, um, at wineries or breweries. Yeah, Andrea, quick, uh, quick yeah. questions here. So you bought uh, your base camp before the base camp X came out. Yeah. And <laughs> the biggest, you know, some of the biggest differences there, you get an extra three inches of clearance, different tires, some solar uh, guards that are different than the ones that you have. Have there been any places that you haven't been able to go because mm -hmm. of the clearance or talk a little bit about the, the roads that you're on? Are they mostly forest roads or just give us a, do you wish you had yeah. the base camp X? There was, there was one campsite that I went to on a riverbed that I wish I hadn't gone to. I didn't damage anything, um, but I, you know, it was probably not the wisest decision. Um, but um, I have not experienced a, a difference between you know, that three inch clearance and the clearance that I have. Um, and I haven't experienced an issue with um, the solar panels. Um, so I'm fine with mine, but um, I know that, that other people are probably taking it to other remote areas too. And that, that three inch might make a difference for them. Um, the X wasn't available when I bought mine, but yes, three inches could be helpful, but I haven't run into that problem. Okay, all right, cool, thanks. Yeah. Um, you know, and really, this it, for me, it's a yurt on wheels. Uh, it's very important for me to be flexible as to uh, the trips that I plan, and it comes to me. They're usually trips that I haven't even planned yet are the ones I'm looking forward to the most. Um, it's the people you want to be with, the, the destination you want to go to. That's really what's important is it, you're looking forward to the trip you have yet to plan. Um, I know we've got some some questions that are coming in and we've got some questions that have come in. How do you want to manage the next three slides here? Chris, you want me to yeah, answer some uh, questions? Why don't, why don't you work on the ones that have already come in and then I'll continue to sift through the, the ones here. Just a reminder to folks, if they want to submit a question, Q&A button at the bottom of the screen here and we'll uh, do our best to, to get to answer. Yeah. So this one, I've, I've actually answered quite a few questions around um, the teak floor I like. Um, and of course the pass-through shower is really important. But how long do you have hot water? 
It takes about 10 minutes to heat up the hot water. Um, and if you're going for five days, you don't want to be taking a shower like you take a shower at home. <laughs> you want to be taking a camping shower. Uh, so outside um, and a, a fairly short shower to rinse off and, and wash your hair. There's definitely enough water uh, for, for two short showers um, and then washing dishes for like four days, but then you really got to be topping off. The other thing that I want to note about water is I do carry an extra water source in my car for water bottles and washing um, veggies and all. That allows you to use less water that are in the tanks. Um, there's been a question about circulation in the trailer. Uh, I don't have a problem with circulation in the trailer. There's a screen on the front door, there's a screen on the back door, and the two side windows pop out just a little bit. And there's a, there's a very strong fan over the kitchen. I haven't had any problem with circulation. Um, and then the question about how long can you boondock for? Um, as I've said, I go about five days, but really you gotta keep your eye on, the, eye on those meters. You gotta be focused on more black than gray in the tank and that additional water source um, for water bottles. On a weekend trip, no problem, it, you, it, you're fine. But if you really wanna be going for five days before you pump out and top off the water, then, then you've gotta be watching that stuff. Andrew, a couple uh, questions just about the, the, the bathroom there, uh, or just the point. So that the Teak Works mm -hmm. mats are actually available directly from Airstream Supply Company. So you can pick, pick the model uh, and get that directly uh, from there. So just, just put in the type of vehicle that you have and the template's already done and we've worked with those folks to, to get that. Um, one question is um, kind of two, not related to the bathroom, but how often do you use the air conditioner? Ah, um, I've used the air conditioner twice. Um, but remember I live in the Northwest uh, where it's quite chilly. Um, and you have to be either plugged in or have a generator to run the air conditioner. When I have run it, it was great. Um, but I've only done it twice. And it was when I was plugged in uh, and was able to, to run it. But it, I, what I find is it works, it works fine the two times that I did use it. So yeah. This next question here is around sleeping capacity. So that you know, Airstream Base Camp is really designed for, for two uh, two people to sleep in. Have you ever, you know, squeezed in a, a, a third? And how does that how does that work? Yeah, yeah definitely. I've I've slept with uh, my two sons who are full grown, the three of us. But remember, we're used to sleeping in tents all the time. Um, so uh, we're we're used to being tight. But I could definitely see, you know, a parent and a child, or a parent and two kid, two small kids. There's a there is a base camp user out there who has two two like um, middle middle school age kids, and I see her pictures of they're set up and it's the same thing, just kind of squeezing in there. Um, this, the bed is about, it's kind of in between a queen and a king. Um, and so what I do is I have a foam topper um, that I, can, I compress, a king size sheet that goes over that, and then two twin comforters. Um, so that it kind of feels like two twin beds when I'm with two people. Um, and then if it's just me, I just set up one side of the bed and I just use one of the comforters. Cool. Um... One specific here, I know that you have a bike that you put in the back. Yeah. Uh, this one is specifically around E mountain bikes that are pretty yeah. big and pretty heavy. Based on, yeah, I know that I know that you don't have one of those, but do you think you could fit two of those back there in the middle area, or is that pushing it? So I put in my base camp two road bikes. Okay. And that that was a tight fit. Okay. They fit, but it was a tight fit. My feeling is um, that if, you're, if you've got like two uh, mountain bikes or two e-bikes, that a rooftop carrier is, on your tow vehicles is a better solution and to preserve the, the bed for carrying other gear or the, the back of the trailer for, ca for carrying other gear. My collapsible bike, um, I actually, a friend of mine has the identical collapsible bike and we put two collapsible bikes in the back of the trailer and that works great, um, but, or two road bikes, but more than that, would really I don't think would be possible. I fit my surfboard, my water ski, and my bike at one time and that's that's been okay. Nice. What uh I think I know the answer to this one, but what out of all the, the mods that you've done to your base camp, what's the one that has risen above to be number number one? Um well the inverter the inverter 
has been necessary for me to work. Yep. Um, so I would say that's that's probably the number one uh, adaptation that I did. Um, that inverter was about six hundred dollars, I think, to to put it in uh, or to purchase it on Amazon and get it in. Um, so I would say that was number one. Um, and then you know, for me, I put in stronger batteries that allows me to go farther. So I would say that was no, it would be number two. And you put in lithium batteries in yours? Yeah. I put in lithium in batteries. Your yeah. Okay. Yeah. Cool. And the airstream, the airstream dealership helped me with that. Awesome. Um, can you talk a little bit just in detail here on the braking system that you added to your SUV, the electronic yeah. brake controller? Yeah, it's a brake controller. I think it was $119. You can get it at um, any of the, um, the, the shops that are oriented around towing. Um, there's lots of them in cities because uh, lots of people are towing. Um, it, it is simple to use. You can increase the, um, the responsiveness on it. Um, but once it's set, I pretty much leave it there. It indicates whether you're connected or not connected, which is actually really handy. Um, but it's uh, it's called a brake controller. The tow shops sell them all the time and install them for you. Cool. Um, one here around uh, on cloudy, rainy days, which are no, yeah. no stranger to you in the Pacific Northwest. Yeah. Um, do you feel, when you're inside, does it feel like you're closed in? Does <laughs> You know, how, how does it feel when you're holed up in the yeah. basement for day? Well, one of the things I love is it still sounds a little bit like a tent with the rain uh, pounding on the trailer. I love that. Um, you know, you kind of feel like you're in a space capsule a little bit, but those windows um, that are in front of the kitchen are really broad, and you get lots of light there. Um, I don't necessarily feel, feel cooped up in a little tiny capsule um, because of those windows. Um, but you definitely, um, if, you know, if you're, I, I had a trip where it rained like three days straight and I didn't get out as much as I wanted. So I spent some time working and watching movies and that sort of thing, but it's okay. One here around uh, heat and showers. So if, if you're not plugged in and you're, you're boondocking somewhere, yeah, uh, no problem to have heat, no problem to have water pressure and, and no. uh, no. That's fine. So the base camp has two propane tanks, and I, I will tell you, uh, those two propane tanks last a really long time, both for the refrigerator, my fire pit, and for um, creating hot water, and the hot water is really hot. Um, so I don't have, a, a, I rarely um, top off those propane tanks, but on a longer trip, I do. Like on, a, on that 18-day trip, I think I filled them twice. Um, and on weekend trips, I don't need to top them off, but definitely those two propane tanks can do hot water, heating the trailer, um, and your fridge, all three. Cool. All right, I'll let you go back to your list of questions on your end. I think, I think I'm done. <laughs> My question, do you guys have more questions for me? Yeah, uh, coming in? See here, one here around um, the thing that everyone loves to do when they have a recreational vehicle is empty the tanks. Is that... <laughs> <laughs> it, easy to do what's what's that process like and and how do you um how do you plan for it and when you're going to to do it and when you need to yeah 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 no it's really important and it's it's something that you learn from experience it's not that much fun um so uh it's it is important to plan ahead as to where you can pump out so okay i'm going on a 12-day trip it looks like i should plan to pump out on day four and day eight and day 12 when i get home um, or on my way home. So there's an app, um, you know, I think it's called RV Dump Sites Near Me, um, that it shows you on the highway where there's dump sites that are public and free, and other ones that are located in RV um, campsites, and other ones that are located in national forest areas. So I plan ahead for where, where, when I'm going to dump. Um, it's important to use the tabs that you put in to the tank uh, to loosen the debris that, and, and the contents of the tanks. Um, so I use those. And it is, it is a little bit of a step-by-step-by-step-by-step by step by step by step process. I recommend watching YouTube videos on it uh, so you see how someone does it. I always use gloves. Um, there's a great, in the, in the base camp, there's a tube at the bottom that holds your sewer tube. Um, 
this, my problem has been my uh, being able to twist that tube on and off with strength. So I have a can of WD-40 in the trailer that, that, I, that I use to loosen that up so that I can turn that on and off easily. The base camp also does not have a flush valve. So I bought an adapter that allows me to um, pump it out or you know drop the sewer, the sewer cable out and connect a hose. And then you turn that hose on that's, that they have at these pump out stations and it flushes the tank for you. you don't have to have it. But I thought on some of these longer trips, it would be an important thing to have. So it's, it's uh, called a, it's an adapter with a flush valve on it. And basically it, it takes fresh water that is at the dump station and allows you to rinse that through everything before yeah. you put everything away. Before you, before you put it all back. It's, you know, you make, you make a mistake once and believe me, you won't make it again. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, uh, it's, you do learn, uh, you do learn it. Watch a couple of YouTube videos, take your time. Those people who are parked behind you, perhaps waiting in line, don't worry about them. They struggle too. They'll get it. They'll get to that pump station. Take your time. Don't rush it. So, yeah. <laughs> One question here about the trailer valet that you use to maneuver the, the base camp into tight spaces. Any issues with that? Has it worked, worked as advertised? Um, that's worked fine. It has its limitations. Uh, it doesn't work well on inclines, and it doesn't work well on gravel. Okay. Thank I don't have either of those situations, um, so uh, so that's fine. I thought at first that I would actually be taking it with me, um, but I, I stopped doing that because it was it's too heavy, too big, and too clunky. Um, it it's um, it's heavy, so um, I find I just leave it in that garage and, and I use it to crank it in and out. That they have a lighter version and a heavier duty version called the XL. Get the heavy duty one, the XL, um, because it, the lighter version won't work. There are other um, trailer movers out there. Um, and I deal with uh, surf boats a lot, and I see maybe five or six different types of movers that people are using to move their surf boats. So the trailer belly is not the only one. There's other ones out there too. Did you make any changes to your the suspension on your your SUV to to tow the base camp, or is everything still stuck? Everything is stuck on that. Yeah. And and you, I know you, you touched on this a little bit with the the bed topper that you use in the back. Can you just give us a little bit more detail on on what that is and how you use it? <laughs> Walmart, sixty five dollars. <laughs> it's a queen size memory foam topper. I wanted to get one that compressed. Um, so there's some memory foam that doesn't compressed down. Um, so it took me, I don't know, a couple of stores to go to um, and Walmart had this. Uh, I, I fold it like a, like a burrito and then roll it up and then tighten some straps around it to keep it tight so that it fits in the starboard bench compartment. Um, I, personally, I like having it. It's, it's pretty comfy. Um, I know some people have said that they, they think that the, um, that a, a topper is really essential. There are times I've slept on that bed without the topper and it's okay. It's totally fine, but I like having that one. And it was, a, it was Walmart that where I got it. On, uh, I know that you have a, you upgraded your batteries to be lithium ion. So those are just drop-ins that fit in the existing, uh, battery box for base camp. Yes. And then, you know, solar on the roof do you have the the plug-in solar uh that you put on the ground yeah so actually i do have one of those panels um yeah. and i use that in addition prior to swapping out to the lithium batteries i use the the rooftop solar panels and then a plug-in panel as well uh and that worked okay worked fine um but I know that I knew that I wanted to go on longer trips. Um, so I swapped out to lithium and I've never used the additional panels since. The rooftop ones are, are completely sufficient for um, cranking juice into those two batteries. So if you, there's a specific question around this, you know, and these are all variables, right? In terms of how much power you're using, how much sun is in, in the sky. Yeah. But yeah. on a sunny day um, and you're just kind of, living normally in the base camp, maybe plugging and charging in your phone or running the inverter every now and then to charge your computer. How, how long do you go? What's, what's the battery level look like over so, time? 
Are we talking about the lithium batteries or are we talking about the stock batteries? The, the, the ones that you have with the, the lithium. So you, how, how long can you go without basically charging or plugging in? Four weeks. Oh, wow. Okay. So a long time. A long time. Yeah. Um, and you really have to be careful with the canopy that you're not parking in a place for a long period of time under a tree canopy. Um, but yeah, I can go four weeks without plugging in. What kind of, uh, bouncing around here on some of the questions as they, as they come in, um, mm -hmm. what kind of maintenance do you have to perform on the base camp outside of just normal cleaning? Yeah, um, I, I clean the drain fairly often in the sink because um, it does uh, develop some things in there. Uh, so I clean the drain. Um, gosh, that's really good. I, I uh, am conscious of when I carry my bike, uh, you know, sort of grease that might get to places. Um, my surfboard sometimes leaves white marks on the floor. So I'm, I'm conscious about cleaning that or protecting that. Um, I will honestly tell you, I haven't had that much maintenance uh, with it. I've had a few things break down and they get fixed, but it's just like a car. It's just things break down, you gotta fix them. Um, I've had, uh, I've, I've had to replace uh, a few parts here and there, but it's not been serious. I know that too, for, for folks who want to kind of dig into some of the, the annual maintenance, just like yeah. or anything like that, the, the owner's manual has a, a recommended maintenance schedule, which is uh, driven mostly by, by time, uh, since you know, there is no odometer on here. So it's usually driven by you know, months or yearly inspections that you want to do to make sure that the vehicle. But uh, I think also why the base camp is attractive is because there's, it's not as, as, um, co as complicated of a system as uh, some of the other um, airstreams. And I like that simplicity. Andrea, did you, there are mirror extensions that you can put on the, uh, the side view mirror, the side, side view mirrors of the tow vehicle, just yeah. to see around it. Do you use those or are the ones on your car just fine? The ones on my car are fine, but I can totally see that if you have, you know, smaller ones, that that would be really nice to have. Um, so I would, uh, I would recommend that for sure. Um, one of the things that I would love to have is that camera that allows you to seamlessly see your, the back of your trailer and the side at the same time. Oh, yeah. yeah. That, that's something in the future, but not now. Yeah. Andrea, a question here specific to your tow vehicle. I know that, um, you use it as a daily driver. Can you tell yeah. a little bit about what it is? So folks looking for yeah. a tow vehicle know what it is. Right. So I have a Porsche Cayenne. Um, and um, its tow capacity is pretty high. Its tow capacity is, is 5,000 pounds. Um, so I'm, I've got more power than, than I need per se on this thing. Um, and uh, one of the things I do notice in, in my car, pulling this trailer a lot, is I go through tires faster. Uh, just driving long distances, but also towing a vehicle, you just go through tires more uh, on your tow vehicle. Important question here around uh, ice cream. Um, <laughs> <laughs> wanting to know if the, if the freezer is cold enough to, to keep yeah. uh, ice cream. If the freezer is cold enough to keep ice cream, it's probably something that I would have on day one or day two, or if there's a restock point on your trip. I like to actually make my ice cubes in advance uh, and put them in a plastic bag and then put them in that freezer. A trick that all uh, trailer owners do is you plug your trailer in uh, a day before you leave and get that refrigerator going, get that freezer going, get it cold before you put your your food in it and before you put any frozen items in it. But um, I, ice cream probably the first couple of days, but you know it it is not something that I'd want to take up space. Quite honestly, the ice is more important for cocktails uh, and and ice water, and then also for me. I sometimes bring, you know, frozen meat um, that I want to keep in there. So. Awesome. Cool. Well, Andrea, thank you very much for, for spending some time with us today. There are some questions I know that we didn't have a chance to get to in the, in the webinar today. So if you send an email to hello at airstream.com, that's H E L L O at airstream.com. Uh, we can make sure that we, we get back to you on those. Some of the names didn't all come through, so we don't know who to follow up with for certain questions. So really appreciate everyone spending part of your Saturday with us. 
And uh, as soon as we exit here, there'll be the feedback uh, form and survey. Two questions. Love to hear what you thought about today and, and what we could do better in the future. Thanks, everyone. Great. Thanks, everyone.